Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We are so glad you are here with us. My name is Abby Haug, and I am a program associate with the Inclusive America Project here at the Aspen Institute. I'm going to get started with just a couple of tech notes, and then we will start right into the conversation. So we are going to have about 45 minutes to an hour of panel discussion at the start, followed by a half an hour of Q&A. We invite you to submit questions at any point during the discussion, and you can do that by clicking the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen. We are also going to be live tweeting this event from our account on Twitter, which is at Aspen underscore IAP. We invite you to join us in conversation over there. There is also an option if you would like closed captioning to view this webinar on YouTube where, we'll be, where we will be live streaming. We are going to circulate that link right now and invite you to go to YouTube if you would like to take advantage of closed captioning. This webinar is being live streamed and will be uploaded as a full recording in just a couple of days and we'll be sure to share that link on YouTube with all of you. I would now like to invite Zinat Rahman, Inclusive America Project Director, to turn on her camera and I will pass the floor over to her. Thank you all. Thank you, Abby. Welcome everybody and thank you for being here. As Abby said, my name is Zinat Rahman and I'm the director of the Inclusive America Project at the Aspen Institute. Last week, we witnessed a violent insurrection on the Hill, a disgusting repudiation of the dem democratic system and of pluralism. Even worse, it's clear from the symbols and imagery that many in the mob felt that their Christian faith justified their actions. This is not what religious freedom is. This is not what Christianity is. Elected officials and other people in power who used religious freedom to justify violence misunderstand our founding virtues. Religious freedom at its essence is a freedom, freedom of conscience, which by definition is diverse and the foundation for a pluralistic democratic society. It's the recognition that we may not always agree, but that our religious disagreements can never justify violence. So can we find a path forward together? Our fellow and resident expert Asma Uddin and her esteemed panelists will discuss the ways today in which we may find common cause while advocating for equal freedom and fairness for all. They bring diverse perspectives and orientations on religious freedom. This is exactly why we've gathered them here together today. We come to this discussion with humility and with the knowledge that we are all in this together. So with that, I'd like to introduce Asma Uddin. Asma is a religious liberty lawyer and scholar working for the protection of religious expression for people of all faiths in the US and abroad. She has a multitude of experience in her background, including as previously working as counsel for the Beckett Fund for Religious Literacy, as an expert advisor on religious liberty for the OSCE, um, as a senior scholar at the Religious Freedom Center at the museum, as a visiting scholar at Brigham Young University Law School and many other appointments. She most recently wrote a book called When Islam is Not a Religion, which examines religious freedom in the United States through the prism of attacks on the rights of American Muslims. I cannot think of a better person to lead this discussion, um, this very important discussion today. And so with that, Asma, I'd love to turn it over to you. Thank you, Zenith, and thank you to our panelists and participants for joining us today. There's no doubt that religious freedom in the US has at various points in our history been applied unevenly to different groups. Today, we're still seeing serious problems and inconsistencies in its application. But it is also true that as recently as 1993, we saw broad bipartisan support for robust religious freedom protections. In response to the Supreme Court's 1990 decision to water down the legal standard for free exercise clause violations, religious and public policy groups across the political spectrum worked together to pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA which reinstituted the strict scrutiny standard. Unfortunately, in more recent years, that bipartisan collaboration seems almost impossible to recreate. The Supreme Court's 2014 decision in Hobby Lobby v. Burwell, in my view, initiated our current round of culture wars. In that case, the court ruled that the, the contraceptive mandate promulgated under President Obama's Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act violated privately held for-profit corporations' right to religious freedom. For many religious believers, and especially conservative Christians with strong objections to either or both abortion and contraception, Obama's healthcare mandate ran roughshod over their deepest held beliefs about the sanctity of life and forced them under pain of penalty to violate those beliefs. While this is what conservatives were feeling, their critics had and still have a very different interpretation. 
In a critic's view, conservatives use religious liberty simply as a tool to roll back protections for women and LGBTQ individuals. This was the cultural landscape that Trump stepped into in 2016. Over the last four years, he not only responded to the needs of a conservative Christian base, but he also unfortunately exacerbated the cultural divide. He demonized many of his opponents as people who sought to destroy America's religious and specifically Christian character. With Trump in office, the narrative also brought in to pit conservative Christians against not just sexual minorities, but religious and racial ones too. And with Christians and other conservatives challenging church closures during the COVID pandemic, the war in some ways became even sharper. For many critics, anyone insisting on their religious rights in the context of a deadly virus was risking millions of American lives. Last week, last week, things got even worse. On January 6th, a violent mob of Trump supporters stormed the United States Capitol in an attempt to overturn Trump's defeat in the 2020 presidential election. Inside the building, Congress had convened a joint session to certify the results of the Electoral College and the protesters wanted to prevent that formalization of Biden's win. It was the ultimate, some would say predictable, manifestation of Trump's four years of spreading disinformation and stoking division. It was political tribalism out of control. Multiple commentators later called the violence a Christian insurrection. Emma Green of Atlantic detailed the many signs, quote, the mob carried signs and flags declaring Jesus saves and God, guns and guts made America, let's keep all three. Some were participants in the Jericho March, a gathering of Christians to pray, march, fast, and rally for election integrity. After calling on God to save the Republic during the rallies at state capitals and in D.C. over the past two months, the marchers returned to Washington with flourish. On the National Mall, one man waved the flag of Israel above a sign begging passersby to say yes to Jesus. Shout if you love Jesus, someone yelled, and the crowd cheered, shout if you love Trump. Conservative commentator David French agreed with Green's assessment. He wrote, quote, we have to be clear about what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. A violent Christian insurrection invaded and occupied the Capitol. Christian music was blaring from the loudspeakers. French himself saw a man carrying a Christian flag into an evacuated legislative chamber. For many, January 6th was a, cl was a clear symbol of Christian nationalism and its sometimes violent underbelly. The violence was a clarion call for conservative white evangelical leaders across the conservative spectrum to repudiate their support for Trumpian politics. From Franklin Graham to Albert Mueller to the consistent never Trumper, Russell Moore, we draw strong rebukes of the president's actions. It seems that some who had mixed feelings about Trump were seeing things a bit clearer. Meanwhile, that same day, another momentous thing happened. Reverend Raphael Warnock was elected to the US Senate he is a senior pastor at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church and a prominent symbol of what many commentators have dubbed the religious left. The religious left consists of Americans who embrace social justice viewpoints and uphold the social gospel. As a movement, they seek to counter the idea that only conservatives can be religious. And with Warnock stating that he will continue to preach at his church even after he takes office, we are witnessing the end of strict separation of church and state in the Democratic Party. We now have two religious parties instead of one, and as some commentators see it, an increasingly vigorous religious left versus an increasingly sclerotic religious right. One other thing we hope to interrogate today is the Christian focus of the religious freedom debate in this country. With so much of the national discourse fixated on the concerns of conservative Christians or on the intra-Christian tension between political liberals and political conservatives, what gets lost are the experiences, including the suffering of religious minorities. I have written about these matters pretty extensively, as Zenith mentioned. The dismissal of Muslims' rights were a centerpiece of Trump's 2016 electioneering. We can't forget the travel ban, the calls to close mosques and spy on Muslim communities. In my first book, When Islam is Not a Religion, I noted the increasing salience among some conservatives of the claim that Islam is not a religion and that Muslims do not have First Amendment rights to religious freedom. And in my forthcoming book, The Politics of Vulnerability, I explain how this movement is intrinsically connected to tribalism and a sense that Christians to preserve their own rights have to limit others' rights. In our increasingly polarized society, tribalism is unfortunately a piece of many of our conflicts and perhaps particularly so when it comes to religious freedom. 
who defines it and how they define it has become a left versus right issue and religious minorities become collateral damage in that fight. So with us today to discuss this and so much more are Amrit Kaur, who is a legal director, director at the Sikh Coalition, where she works to protect the civil rights of all Americans in areas such as hate crimes, bullying, profiling, workplace discrimination, and religious rights. Prior to her work at the Sikh Coalition, Amrit was a prosecutor in the city of Chicago for over 10 years. Monse Alvarado is a vice president and executive director of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. With a background in public policy and campaigns, Monse has worked on complex matters such as religious liberty issues and the contraceptive mandate, the ability of churches to choose their leaders, and free speech of crisis pregnancy centers and religious groups on campuses. And Michael Ware is a strategist, speaker, and practitioner at the intersection of faith, politics, and public life. Michael directed faith outreach for President Obama's historic 2012 re-election campaign and was one of the youngest White House staffers in modern American history. He served in the White House Faith-Based Initiative during President Obama's first term, where he led evangelical outreach and helped manage the White House's engagement on religious and values issues. So I invite the panelists to turn on their cameras and reflect on, I think, the, let's start with like the bigger question that I sort of set out in the, in the very beginning of my, my statement, which is the shift in recent years from religious freedom being something that was largely bipartisan, a lot of sort of uh, cross ideological, cross faith uh, collaboration on it, and now something that unfortunately, uh, even as religious freedom is seen by eight in 10 Americans as at least a somewhat important issue, its purpose and meaning are understood in vastly different ways depending on one's political leaning. So, Monte, if you can start us off, how do you, I mean, as you understand it, what has religious freedom come to mean in America today? And how do we get to this point? Are there certain cultural, historical, political movements that you think have shaped the way that we understand religious freedom today? And perhaps you can also comment a bit on Beckett's recent polling, as I know that the Beckett Fund has been uh, polling Americans on their, their attitudes about religious freedom. Thanks so much, Asma. It's great to be here with you talking about this really important issue and it's something that I've dedicated 12 years of my life to. Um, and so I take a step back always and try to think about the bigger picture and what has happened culturally, politically. Um, I do think that when I first started, the contraceptive mandate was something that was just beginning. And this rhetoric around um, Christians and religious majorities being threatened and being um, in, you know, targeted was something that had just begun. And we're also, we also have to remember that the Twitter reality that we know now wasn't what it, what it is now, 10 years ago. Um, a lot of people try to kind of pinpoint what went wrong in the discussion. And I do think that a lot of the siloing that we're seeing and the tribalism, tribalism that we're seeing, which I would attribute to a lot of the lack of civil discourse, um, is, is very much um, furthered by the, the isolation that is created through social media channels. Um, something that was meant to foster dialogue has definitely broken down those lines of communication and allowed people to listen only to viewpoints that they want to listen to. So I think we can put a pin on that. Uh, politically, the idea that we would be able to solve religious problems and problems of culture and civil discourse only through political actions would be the second piece of focus on executive orders, which has been used by the right and the left, and a desire desire to um, weaponize religious freedom and, uh, and also vilify people who believe in religious freedom. Both of those are bad, both of those extremes. The description that you gave on religious freedom as something that was bipartisan in 1993 when the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was passed, um, that bipartisan support for religious freedom came from a desire to protect religions that didn't weren't necessarily mainstream, that people didn't really understand, or that for one reason or another were pinned against the wall. Um, I think that that, uh, that desire is something that we still have. And the Religious Freedom Index, which the Beckett Fund launched two years ago, is a proof of that. Americans continue to say that 70%, it was 80% um, if, you, if you look at the numbers by demographics, but I would confidently say 70% of Americans believe that religious freedom is a very important right and it's a foundational right for our country. And if you get down into the nitty gritty, it is um, young people, Generation Z, uh, anyone who is not a millennial, like most of us are on this call, um, I, I really, they feel like they've been targeted for their beliefs. 
And I think that anyone that had ex has experienced bigotry in any way, shape or form, uh, which we're seeing more and more of now in more explicit ways and a lot of bullying online as well, know what, what it's like and don't want that for someone else. Thank you, Monson. Michael, can you comment on that? I know in a recent New York Times piece, you kind of touched on this question of, of what I call vulnerability, the sense of like grievance that a lot of Christians are feeling. No, it, it's it's really key. And just, uh, Asma, just your work has just been so helpful to me and, and really the, the work of everyone on this call. And, and thanks for Aspen and, and Zenod and, and her team for, uh, for providing this forum. Um, Religious freedom, uh, in my view, needs to be restored in the public imagination as crucial to how we figure out how to live together as we are, as opposed to something that is subject to the kind of political prerogatives of elected officials. Uh, religious freedom ought to be a dependable backstop kind of preventing that um, or alleviating some of that sense of vulnerability, uh, much like sort of uh, upholding the rule of law, uh, something that makes our political disagreements sort of less existential. Uh, as you pointed out in your, in your opening, unfortunately, we've had both uh, political circumstances and political leaders um, that have taken the opposite approach. And there is much repair that is needed um, in this regard. I, I think the incoming Biden-Harris administration is going to have to pay attention to particular communities which have been directly, and I mean that lit literally directly harmed uh, by President Trump's irresponsible rhetoric and actions when it comes to religion in many regards, from the travel ban, as you mentioned, to an insufficient response to anti-Semitism, uh, to the narrow focus of religious outreach coming out of the White House. Um, the incoming administration will need to make clear that once again, America is uh, for people of all faiths and none, that the federal government has the backs of those who face hatred or discrimination because of their religion or what others perceive their religion to be. I, I also think at the same time, you know, it's going to be important for the incoming administration to, uh, yes, comfort those who have been afflicted, also to make clear that religious freedom is not going to be subject to the uh, to, to the sort of political makeup uh, of a religious con uh, 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 constituency or a demographic or tradition related to the, uh, the, 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 current, the current government. That religious freedom is transcendent, that religious freedom actually uh, gives a, a, a buffer uh, between what is accomplished through uh, what can be accomplished, what we would want to accomplish through uh, through policy instruments. Um, and as uh, the incoming president has said, religious freedom is a primary area in which we need to lower uh, the temperature. There are ways to do that. We could talk about that. We could talk about what's happened in the past, but, but, but th those, are, those are my opening comments. Th there's a responsibility on the incoming administration as well as uh, leaders on both sides of the aisle. And, and, and frankly, all of us, religious or not, as citizens, uh, to reject using something as foundational as religious freedom as just another sort of political football, another political pawn. Amrit, as we're reflecting on some of these cultural and political movements, I mean, oftentimes it becomes a very Christian-focused conversation. And I know that yours are very much, you know, knee-deep in working on very concrete injustices faced by the Sikh community. Can you reflect on that, on the question of religious minorities and specifically Sikh Americans? Yeah, first, thank you so much for having me, Asma. This is such an interesting panel. I really appreciated your opening. Um, I think in order to answer your question, I wanna go back and um, think about a point that Monsi brought up uh, related to the, the Christian majority and at what point did, um, did they feel targeted? I think in the religious minority perspective, um, the basis of the lack of religious freedom and the lack of a cultural understanding has always been that the Christian, the broader Christian community has felt targeted. Um, and 
in the manner that they felt targeted, it's kind of really related to the fact that so many religious minorities look different. They might have different articles of faith. Um, they might have different exercises and practices, uh, different foods, you know, different um, decorations in their homes, obviously speaking different languages. Um, and I think that for a large group of majority religious groups, that was really scary. Um, and it was a reason to, it was a basis essentially to create a system that was based ascent on uh, a racist sort of religiously um, exclusive community. And I, I think over the course of our country's history, we've seen that evolve. Um, originally, it was Catholics that were on the outs with the broader religious Christian majority, you know, and then we see that move down the road with uh, Muslims, with Jews, with Muslims, with Sikhs, with a number of other minority religious groups. And so um, I think that there's a long-standing history of, um, at least in, in minority religious communities, of feeling that they have been targeted because the majority Christian groups felt targeted first. And so I just want to kind of bring that home because I feel like that's a really important perspective that a lot of people do kind of hold on to. And when we're talking about what are sort of the, the battles that religious minorities, for example, the Sikh commun community that I represent feel, um, I think religious freedom, especially for Sikhs and other minorities is really focused on acknowledgement and intentionality in order to get to a place of reconciliation. And what I mean by that is I think there needs to be um, an acknowledgement of the fact that there has been the system in place that didn't allow for religious freedom for all within this country. Um, and that's step one. Once we've acknowledged that, there needs to be intentional activity leading towards creating freedom and inclusivity for all. And then step three is the reconciliation of that, the reconciliation of the acknowledgement coming up with the steps to move forward and then bringing all of that together. We've seen cultural wars that result from uh, a lack of religious freedom. You know, obviously we've seen um, this intersectionality of culture and religion in ways that turn religion into ethnicities for many groups. And I think that there's a big dispute amongst religious minorities uh, as to whether that's an acceptable path forward or not. Um, Asma, when we spoke the other day, what, you brought up an interesting topic. Um, Islam is religion, Muslims are, are not the religious group, right? And I think there's sort of a, um, a disenfranchisement there because people get confused between what the religious exercises are and what the cultural exercises are. Um, and I think it's really important for all of us to understand that when we have these movements that sort of pit culture and religion um, and politics and so many other facets of the world that we live in today against each other, we are inevitably going to get to a place where freedom doesn't exist, especially religious freedom. And I think because religion is such a divisive topic, it's the, also the easiest topic for people to disagree on and decide that they're not gonna budge and they just really dig in their heels. Um, so I kind of view the, the minority religious experience um, as one of just really at this point in 2021, trying to move into the conversations that we wanna have related to acknowledgement and um, and getting to the point of restoration and reconciliation and how do we start those conversations over again? Because to your point earlier, there's been so much divisiveness that it seems like the, the conversation might've been at different levels in years past, but there's been a breakdown now and we have to start over. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the question about just being acknowledged is, is pretty critical. I mean, in my forthcoming book, I talk about, you know, I, I work a lot with the sort of focus on Muslims as a minority that I'm researching and writing about. But ultimately, the questions about that I'm talking about are really sort of a microcosm for much bigger issues. And the phrase that I use in the book is that Muslims have essentially become collateral damage and our current, you know, essentially a proxy for much bigger issues and this ideological battle between uh, conservatives and liberals. And so when you kind of talk about this question of acknowledgement, it's just like, can we just see Muslim, Sikhs, on, on a range of other minorities or people who sort of don't fit neatly into this Christian versus something 
uh, debate as for who they are, for their actual substantive beliefs um, and experiences and suffering in a way that, you know, just it doesn't just sort of use them to sort of prove a point on one side or the other. And, you know, the question of it being seen as an ethnicity versus or a racial minority versus a religious minority, that's absolutely uh, a big part of what I was writing about in When Islam is Not a Religion, this idea that even in the defense of, of Islam, it can sometimes be mutated into something that's not a religion, right? So we can defend you, but we can defend you on these other terms as, you know, instead of the actual substance of what of your beliefs. Um, and this question, I think, I see, Michael, you're nodding. I think it looks like you have some thoughts on that. Well, no, I, mean, I, I just think it's, I think it's critically important. It's why, you know, I think we need, um, you know, it was important near the end of President Obama's time in office, he visited a mosque in, in Baltimore, which was a significant thing. And I, I would expect that the Biden-Harris administration will uh, take care to do this sort of explicit direct recognition. What I would hope that Christians would see is that uh, by um, that recognition makes greater space for the recognition of their religious beliefs, that they're, that they're not in conflict. As a matter of fact, I think it's uh, particularly in the, in the moment that we're going into, if religious freedom is going to be defended, it's going to be defended for people of all faiths and none or not at all. Like, like su successful defense of religious freedom is going to look like uh, a different faith standing up for the religious exercise and freedom of those who share a faith different from their own, those who are willing to speak up for the religious expression of those not like them to uh, politicians who may think they could get away with targeting a particular community depending on what their constituency looks like. Those are the kind of bridges that have to be built as uh, as several of you have noted, uh, it, it wouldn't be unprecedented. Uh, we, uh, uh, for those who read the amicus briefs in uh, Supreme Court cases uh, referring to religious freedom, you'll often find uh, the Southern Baptists on the amicus brief uh, 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 related to the religious freedom of uh, of of. Uh, Muslims, uh, you'll often Michael, find Michael, you're Orthodox. walking right into my wheelhouse, and I'm more I, than happy. I'd, I'd love, I'd love to have you have you <laughs> uh, take over. Uh, but I mean, I mean, in large part, that's why I think your work is so uh, important because uh, you do. Uh, Beckett uh, is responsible for uh, uh, defending the religious freedom of so many different kinds of groups, and therefore sending an important message about what religious freedom can be and ought to be, not just as a legal principle, but as something that could actually promote social cohesion as opposed to something that pulls us apart. Yeah, I agree with you, Michael. And I think there's two things, something you said and something Amrit said. So I'm gonna parse those out, Asma, if you don't mind. Um, one thing is um, getting lumped in as um, conservatives because you're religious. I think that's a really important point to remind people that seeing religion as something good for society, as a pillar of civil society, as a path toward human flourishing is something that um, a lot of people don't like. So I think that's the first hurdle is what's your understanding of religion as a social good or religion is something that can be um, used as a partnership with the government or in partnership with community building exercises that kind of further tying people together rather than pulling them apart. And this idea that you can stand alongside someone that you fundamentally disagree with. I think that's the hard part. Um, religions that kind of are similar, you know, Catholics and Christians together, or people of the book together, or Jews, Muslims, Catholics, Christians, whatever, all of us together, religious minorities then added in. When you think about that broad diversity and the fact that there are things that we fundamentally disagree on and that we should be using religious freedom much more as a door opener than anything else. All it does is open up that door and allow you to have this conversation. But then it's what you do with the conversation, which is the second piece. That's Amrith, you say this all the time. You talk about, I'm so glad you went and visited my house of worship. What are you actually gonna do with what I need? How are you actually gonna manifest that into policy solutions or religious freedom uh, decisions at the Supreme Court? Justice Alito last summer said, some, said something that I thought was so interesting in a case about um, religious freedom for schools and their right to choose their teachers. He said, some of our terminology is so Protestant that we think that we've given freedom 
to someone when we create this great ruling at the Supreme Court, but when it's actually interpreted in itself, it's discriminatory. And people can't see beyond that because their view of religious freedom is religious freedom for me and not for thee. And so in, it's in the application that we lose ground because of our lack of religious literacy, because we don't actually know what other people believe. We are so uh, incapable of seeing that someone would be a good person and disagree fundamentally with us. And, and that's hard. And it's particularly hard right now because we're talking about a resurgence of religious violence or even political violence um, where we're all on edge. We've all been home for the past year. We're all struggling financially, physically, mentally. And then on top of that, we're trying to get along. And so I think that the hurdles and what you were saying in terms of a call to unity from um, the Biden administration are real, but I think that even more so because, um, because the administration that is that they're coming out of leaned into some of the divisions that were created by the contraceptive mandate litigation. That was a huge issue. The fact that we're still litigating the, the, the issues of nuns and contraceptives that exemption has been there forever. We should, that's one of those things that could lower the temperature, could really be an opportunity to say, hey, this is not something that we need to continue to fight over. We fought over it for 10 years. Let's find a solution and move on. Um, and that solution can't be squashing people's religious liberty. Squashing the religious objector cannot be the solution to that. Nancy, you, you said something that was so true when you were talking about sort of the 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 neutral policies that have these disparate impacts on communities um asma when we talk about religious freedom that is probably one of the biggest issues and the biggest hurdles that religious groups um, across the board minorities and majority groups feel um, when you have these policies that create this impact that disproportionately affects people of various religious groups and don't allow them to practice or exercise or live their daily lives in the way that you know they would need to to really fully achieve their religious goals. I think that's so important and Michael to your point I do hope that the Biden administration thinks about those types of policies and really reviews them in the Department of Justice and the different agencies that we have in our government are going back and looking at those policies and making sure that they are willing and ready to represent people um, in you know, religious liberties cases where we have this disparate impact. Yeah, I mean, just, just to, I, I think, you know, I, I would hope the, the one thing that the last four years have shown us, and frank, frankly, this is for folks sort of on, on my side of the aisle, I, I, I think some hold the idea that sort of the best way to, approach religion in an increasingly pluralistic society is to sort of try and downplay it, to sort of try and ignore it as a force. I, I think the last four years have shown us that religion is still uh, extremely salient. And if you are, uh, you, you not to speak sort of, crit, but you, know, you, you have to be on the field. Um, and that's particularly true when it comes to religious freedom sort of ignoring religious freedom, trying to downplay it is just not gonna be, um, trying to only uh, say what it is not and not advance a positive vision for religious freedom. Even if that's not, even if your positive vision is not the same as others' positive vision, I, I think we need to um, have a, a forward thinking, uh, leaning approach when it comes to identifying the role that religion continues to play in millions and millions of Americans' lives and in our society, uh, the alternative, again, sort of downplaying it, thinking that by muting religion, it helps people come together. Um, th th that's just not the world we, we live in. It's certainly not the country you know, we live in. Well, this idea of a selective understanding of religious freedom, and even as we've, ta as, as we've talked about, this idea of what even constitutes a valid religion for purposes of this conversation about religious freedom, I mean, that's a pretty big issue, right? It's a very concretely impacts people's actual human rights and their day-to-day -day sort of ability to engage in the practices that are so deep to their identity. Um, you know, so there's a couple of different aspects here. I mean, so, so one, I, I'd be interested in getting your take, um, whoever wants to speak on this, on the way that this has played out even internationally and international policy. Uh, Michael, you mentioned the travel ban. And I know that even the, the first iterations of the travel ban were very concretely and very explicit about which persecution mattered and which minorities mattered. 
right? So it's so often, again, this conversation, I think it was a lot subtler in many ways before Trump in the sense that, yeah, we're kind of talking about religious freedom, but we have a very specific group in mind and a very specific group that we are going to make sure not to think about. And then that became very, very explicit during Trump's uh, term. And so I'd like to hear a little bit from you on that. Um, and then I also want to throw out the, the sort of the horrific thing that, that we all witnessed at the U.S. Capitol um, last week. And this that's, I think, another extreme manifestation of this, right? Like when the, the various parts that I could quoted from David French and Emma Green, this conflation of religion and tribe, and specifically that this is what America is and this is what the American tribe is defined in this way. That's another way that we can see this very sort of explicit exclusion of other groups and other conceptions of religion even, even even other interpretations of Christianity, that a Christianity that doesn't sort of line itself up in this way uh, with nationalist interests is somehow not the one that's being, that's, that's true to, to America's character and America's identity. Um, so just throwing those two out there, two pretty different angles here, but you guys take them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just offer a few quick thoughts on the, on the international side. And then I, I do have thoughts about January 6th, but I'll, I'll I would love for others to jump in there first, but just to, uh, uh, I, I think your, you know, to, to begin his administration with with the the, the travel ban uh, was incendiary, and I, I I think set the tone for so much of what would follow uh, over the last four years. I, I will say I I, I do think uh, you sir continue to do really important work uh, during the Trump administration. I do want to acknowledge uh, Ambassador Brownback, um, who I think worked hard to uh, prove his attentiveness to various religious communities, not just persecuted Christians. Um, and I, I think some of the proof for that just shows up in his in his in his travel and where he was spending his time. So I, I do think that there were there were some moments, uh, some some aspects of of continued progress on international religious freedom. It's really important for folks to understand religious persecution has hit all time highs in the last decade. Um, this is not a, uh, this is not a sort of, um, this is not a golden age for uh, religious freedom as a human right. Uh, religious freedom around the world is increasingly pressured in, in profound ways. Um, a few comments about the Obama administration. First, I just say, you know, I think the handoff uh, to go from uh, Ambassador David Saperstein, who, in my view, was was excellent in his role, to Ambassador Brown. We've had two very good ambassadors. Um, uh, significant effort was made. To Monsi's point, significant effort was made uh, to uh, increase religious literacy among foreign diplomats. Um, really extraordinary resources. I know that we have folks from uh, the organization Frank Wolf founded uh, in the last year of President Obama's time in office. He signed uh, the, the bill named after Frank Wolf, which uh, increased some of the, the, the powers of uh, user, it, it increased some of the levers at the disposal of the federal government um, to uh, advance religious freedom around the world. And so there have been some substantive policy Changes uh, under Obama, uh, a uh, office for uh, 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 a faith-based office at state was created, which uh, again sort of greatly enhanced throughout the State Department uh, religious literacy and sensitivity to uh, religious communities around the world and the way that that interacts with uh, American foreign policy. That that is uh, work that needs to be strengthened. Uh, that needs to be expanded. I do think that there's significant work. And I think I think the incoming administration has the people in place, particularly as we saw Ambassador uh, Samantha Power just named to lead uh, USAID. I think we're going to see uh, an administration that reasserts the that human rights are integral to American foreign policy, that that uh, uh, that we don't just have a transactional foreign policy. Um, and, and I think all that to say, there, there is positive work over the course of both the Trump and the Obama administrations that can be built on uh, the incoming administration, much like it has to do domestically, has to be sure to send the message that human rights, that religious freedom and the religious freedom of all is, uh, is, is valued by the United States and won't be overlooked. I, I, I mean, just one more 
uh, one more thing I, I just feel like I have to mention is, uh, you know, the religious freedom challenges around the world range from uh, what is unfortunately become sort of routine, just institutional discrimination, but then also just extraordinarily historic um, tragedies like what we're seeing in China right now, um, like what we're seeing in uh, particular hotspots or, or around the world. And, and, and those can't fall off of America's conscience, uh, either the conscience of the American people or of our government. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be critical moving forward. I'm happy to jump in. Amrith, you're an attorney and Asma, you are too. Full disclosure, I am not, <laughs> even though I've been at a law firm for 12 years. Um, and, and I will say, Michael, I'm with you on what USURF did and on the religious literacy um, endeavors. They were, I think, outstanding um, and innovative in, in a moment where we really didn't have solutions for what we could do. Um, I heard something on, on NPR last week as I was, you know, struggling to figure out what we were supposed to do. It was a really hard moment for our team. We are based in DC, our office is blocks away from, from the Capitol. And, um, and, and you sit and you reflect what kind of a shift in society could create that kind of violence and that kind of unrest and that kind of, it really seemed like soul searching, you know, for an identity, but also for, for answers. And anyone who thinks that religion is is not a is not solace there, um, I think is kind of hitting at the at the answer the wrong way. I do think that people were looking for something, especially after that, a moment of silence, a call to unity for to whatever God you believe in, to figure out who we are and what that means and what a path forward looks like. And I didn't see anyone do that. Um, and I would have wanted to see some, you know, people in leadership, religious leaders in particular, call out for something like that to bring us together, not relying on the government to do it because the government isn't always gonna have the solutions. Most of the time it doesn't, um, it, but calling on the people to turn around and self-reflect. So I will say to me, that's what I was looking for. That's what I wanted to see, um, a moment of unified reflection. Um, but I do think that it also comes from this, this idea that um, if we export religious freedom, it's because we believe that religion is something positive. And it's because we believe that um, there are there are places around the around the globe that don't have the proper understanding of what freedom looks like for the individual and why religious freedom is the bedrock bedrock of a true democratic society and a society that allows its individuals to flourish within it and to disagree with government, which we know doesn't happen around the globe. And so getting back to the comment that I heard on the radio is how does the United States expect to export these ideas if it doesn't have them itself. And I thought that was great commentary. And it should bring us to reflect both for the past administration and this administration, what we want, to, how we want to be perceived and what we want that to look like. Again, going back to the point of tribalism, when we look at the travel ban cases and how they were litigated, um, the idea that the government was establishing religion by kicking certain people out or, or looking at targeting certain people as it was described, right? That's what those, that's, that's how the press covered those cases. From a litigation perspective, um, the Beckett Fund wanted to see people look at this as a restriction on free exercise, a restriction on our ability to actually do what we do once we discover what religion is. Religious freedom is are your ability to search for God and then do something with it, not just find him and stay in your house, but do something with it. And so that's what those cases were really about, but no one talked about them in that way. No one litigated in that way. And so we didn't see what could have happened, what could have been a truly crystallizing moment for people who say that they defend religious minorities and defend um, the Muslim community in the United States. Um, and people who want to come here to have this freedom and long for it. I'm an immigrant. I'm all for coming to this country and wanting to have the good things we've got here. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but then we have to understand what it is we're actually looking for. And I think that was the, a major failure for advocates of, of religious freedom who wanted to see something different in those cases. Asma, I feel like what we saw from the Muslim ban cases and then further a few months into the Trump presidency was a complete sort of decimation of our refugee and resettlement program by so many standards. Essentially, when we talk about how do we create 
challenges and culture war, war, culture wars based on religion when religion should be completely left out of it. And wh what is our place internationally um, on that train ride? I think just the complete failure to really understand and distinguish between uh, longstanding issues that the United States might have had with the Middle East or different parts of the world, and then conflate those issues with specific religious groups, um, and then further decimate our refugee and resettlement program for religious groups that are actually being targeted in those regions or people that are being targeted that did need an escape route because they were being so persecuted, kind of, to me, really push forward this divide that we have and this sort of people, again, digging in their heels on um, being anti-religion or anti-certain religions. And I think as at a global level, when we as a country failed to acknowledge that there were actually people being religiously persecuted in other parts of the world, number one, and number two, failed to understand that there is a difference between policies, longstanding policies that we might've had on cultural fronts um, on business and socioeconomic fronts that should be separated out from religion um, and just sort of put all of that together in one bucket and created really terrible policies that further discriminated and persecuted against these groups. What we told the rest of the world, I think, is that we don't care about these global human rights movements that also have a religious bent to them. And we, in fact, further inflamed the uh, religious zealots in some cases, and in other cases inflamed sort of individuals that wanted to have really negative impressions about religion in general. And now what we end up with is people that again are digging in their heels, either they're uh, the belief of none and they don't wanna listen to the religious, the fact that other people do have a belief in religion or exercise a certain religion, or they're really staunch about their beliefs and don't see, um, don't see the common ground between the fact that there is uh, a push and there should be a push and there is a constitutional basis for individualized practice of religion and respect for religion, even if we're a secular country. Um, and, you know, as far as your original question on where do we stand on a global level and what have our policies done, I think that's what they've done. They've completely failed to recognize what these human rights movements have been at a global level and how that impacts religion, I, whether it's majority groups or minority groups. And they've brought that divide into the US by failing to recognize that the US is a country that resulted from people of persecuted faiths, you know, um, at our inception. So I think that was sort of one of the big issues and then leading to January 6th, what you've got is the end result of people that have just taken a stand, you know, right or wrong. And obviously I disagree strongly with the actions that occurred on January 6th. Um, I also recognize that it didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened over four years of terrible policies and a failure to recognize that there are a diverse, there's a diverse groups, uh, diverse groups of religious groups in this country and across the world, all of which require some level of acknowledgement as to their ability to be um, practicing their faith and exercising their faith in a manner that best fits them. Um, and I don't think that. January 6th was at all a surprise. I mean, I was surprised that they were able to get into the Capitol, but I think that um, the fact that we had people that are angry enough and um, disillusioned enough to go there, I think shouldn't be a surprise. Um, that, has, that is just the culmination of four years of policies that fail to recognize the distinction between religion and policies and cultures um, and just sort of jumbles everything together into one pot. So what struck me about what each of you guys said is this idea of like a transactional nature to our understanding, so the government's understanding of religious freedom, right? So Michael, you can use that phrase uh, when talking about international religious freedom, kind of like, well, how can religious religion and religious freedom be used to sort of benefit the U.S. and our interests? And when it doesn't benefit, it we or if it might be problematic for our interests, and maybe something that we should ignore. 
And similarly, I'm, I'm kind of getting that sense also about in, in the domestic context, I, uh, con, uh, context. I think if you use the word transactional, you can under, begin to understand even what happened with religious freedom over the last four years. I think it was very you know, explicit at many times that the way the Trump administration and Trump specifically was thinking about these things was that if I do something for this, these people who are my base, you know, for their religious interests, what will I get in return? And, and many commentators kind of talked about that, um, said that he himself is not very religious, but he'll certainly put on the facade and talk about the importance of religion for the purposes of serving his own, his own power. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when I think about solutions, which I want to move to now in, in our last few minutes before we open it up to the audience for questions. Um, you know, when I think about solutions, what I propose in the past is almost a transactional issue as well. Like I think about this idea that a number of you have touched on that religious freedom as a legal concept, as a philosophical concept, only works if it's for everyone. And so if you're going to actively sort of limit it for another group, all you're really succeeding in, in doing is limiting it for yourself, because that's just the way the legal sort of jurisprudence and the precedents work. And I know that the Beckett Fund talks about this a lot um, in just the, the interlinkedness of our rights. And so, you know, and, and a lot of people are like, that's so transactional in nature to be saying that we have to come to a solution and that we have to heal on the basis of self-interest. But ultimately, I mean, I think that's a starting point, uh, especially in a context like the one we have now where there's so much cynicism and so much tribalism uh, in our response to the other side. Some thoughts on that. I mean, the idea that no religion is an island sounds transactional, but it's really not. Um, again, it's opening that door. If you start having these conversations and under, I mean, under the Obama administration, you had the Know Your Neighbor campaign. If you start having these conversations with people and you get to know them, they're not as scary. I think a lot of that is that lack of literacy. You have a lot of people who say, well, oh, you're religious, you scare me. Get to know them. Get to, that actually is on you. That responsibility is yours to get to know that person and what they believe and why they're scary. And that goes for everyone, you know? Um, and so if you're, uh, you, you are, have a very large religious community, you probably need to know, get to know people who don't understand um, or who don't agree with you or who believe something completely different just to be a good human, <laughs> you know? But, um, but I also think that it's, it's part of our history. It's part of our, um, our heritage and finding this big narrative Zooming out and thinking about the bigger picture of who we are as Americans means going back, thinking about our history, obviously recognizing the horrible parts of it, but also the beautiful parts of it and what we've been able to create and how unique we are and finding the, the kind of the hope in it. Right now, we're really sitting on the negative aspects of certain things that have happened in our past um, on both sides. And I think it's really important to try to move forward with a little bit of hope that allows us to have these conversations and lower the temperature in a positive way and to extend that dialogue, that friendly dialogue and eventually friendship. It's all about, it really is about friendship. It really is about these kind of basic principles, not just of respect and tolerance. I talk about tolerance all the time as being the minimum. Tolerance is not the answer to anything. You're tolerating someone, you don't actually care about them. It's moving into the next step where the other person's flourishing and the other person's life actually matters to you and you don't want them harmed and you don't want them hurt, not because of the golden rule, I don't do it to you because you're not gonna do it to me, but because it would be wrong to do that to you and that you can recognize that in yourself and in someone else. Um, and, and I think that the other, the other issue that, that has come about that I would love to see change is this issue of lumping everything into religious liberty. Everything isn't religious liberty. Religious liberty is a very important thing that we all should know and understand, but it doesn't encompass everything. Um, and trying to figure out how to shift the dialogue there too, where we can recognize its importance and the critical nature of religious freedom, but also then look at other things for what they are. Not everything is religious discrimination. Some, some things are just really bad policy that hurt people um, for other reasons. Uh, and I think that would help us to kind of lower the temperature on this and get, get to the other side. Yeah, I agree that building bridges is definitely the the foundational starting point. I think a big part of being able to do that, to Monsi's point, is getting to know your neighbor, actually being intentional about having discussions and seeking out people in your midst that are different from you and come from diverse backgrounds from your own. And just getting to understand who they are. You might not become best friends, but it's an opportunity to get to know somebody and to sort of 
break down the preconceived notions and the stereotypes that you might have had of somebody that looks like them, you know, whether it or speaks in an accent the way they do or comes from a country like they do. Um, I think that's sort of step one. And then also along the lines of building bridges is doing a real sort of in-house internal gut check on policies, procedures, you know, whether that's us as a nation and our federal agencies doing it, whether it's a state government, whether it's private industry, whether it's individuals in their own home, just sort of doing this internal like in-house check on where you are at and whether the, the thought processes and policies and procedures that you live your lives by and you operate your industries by are, are in fact inclusive, um, inclusive for people of religion, inclusive for people of no religion. And what does that mean? Um, and also I think part of that is doing a balancing test on, um, on whether the religious uh, is sort of the, the system that you have in place is fair to people of religion, no religion, and also to people that uh, for what, you know, need to be protected for other reasons, other vulnerable communities. I think all of that sort of like comes into the bucket of what this building bridges looks like. And then I think one thing that really needs to happen again, is a stakeholder consultation. I think it's so important that you're bringing people of diverse communities to the table to discuss what sort of policies and procedures need to be implemented moving forward. Um, I think as a, as a nation, we are hit or miss on that topic. Um, and I'd love to see this new administration kind of implement a process by which stakeholder cons a consultation really sort of is at the forefront and a big part of moving forward in um, in just the working notions. And I think that's going to result in access. And to me, coming to a place of reconciliation is really about allowing access for people, whether it's um, religious majorities, minorities, people of no faiths, um, I just want to see us in a spot where we are we are atoning for what's happened in the past in ways that provide access and equal access to different groups. Um, and finally, I think one of the biggest, uh, one of the most important aspects of any solution is going to be offering transparency. You know, and this kind of feeds into uh, consulting with stakeholder groups, but um, we need to have transparency so that as a society, we feel like our elected officials, our community leaders are all being held accountable. And I don't think that there's gonna be any sort of reconciliation until we have accountability. I mean, my background as a prosecutor is about the justice system and that's what justice is. It's holding people accountable. And that is the only way that people who have suffered at their hands are ever gonna feel acknowledged um, and feel like they can sort of wipe the slate clean and move forward. So I kind of see all of that as the path forward to the solutions. I, I just, uh, so many important points were just made. I, I just wanna pull out too, um, but but really it's, uh, that, that, was, that was really rich. Um, it, you indicate, at least what I heard was this indication, which, which I believe really strongly, which is that, in the 21st century, successful, at least, successful religious freedom advocacy is going to be accompanied by a sort of civic sensibility, a civic awareness of the way that religious freedom interacts uh, with, uh, with society. And uh, as you mentioned, that is a burden that, that government needs to bring. It's also a burden that individual actors need to bring. Um, what, what does, if, if uh, religious freedom is about, is an important piece of how we live together, then religious freedom has to be thought of in the context of community. So I, I just think that's absolutely critical. And then this idea of transparency, um, I, I, do, I do have to say, and I may be opening, opening up something here, but I think it's important to say, um, I, uh, I think there have been some elected officials and some local and state governments who have done, that have done great jobs. I do think there have been others who have made a determination internally, to, to, to Amrit's point, that made a determination internally about the kinds of public health protocols that are necessary 
um, during over the course of this last year. And uh, to the extent that those have applied to religious communities, figured, you know, we could just put this all out and it's all under the banner of science and public health. And if uh, restaurants and if bowling alleys uh, have to abide by the rules, then religious communities just have to abide by them as well. Um, I, I think that there's been a lacking appreciation uh, for the role that religion plays in citizens' lives and the lack of that consultation. And uh, 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 too many elected officials have approached religious communities, not as partners, but as problems to solve. Um, when uh, I am convinced that had religious stakeholders in some of these states and some of these localities been engaged positively, if they hadn't been sort of top down, but actually been invited to be joint stakeholders, joint sort of civic leaders in saying, this is what we need to do as a community to be healthy, uh, uh, that, that some of the conflict, some of the sense of embattlement that we've seen um, would have been alleviated. And, and I think that's a, that should be a chief priority of the incoming administration to sort of hit the reset button on the way that governments have been approaching religious communities, because this is really going to be an all hands on deck situation. Um, and if, if faith communities aren't a part of dealing with the fallout of COVID and keeping folks safe, then any strategy is gonna be uh, incomplete and, and perhaps um, you know, uh, uh, flawed in a, in a really detrimental way. Awesome. Uh, so, a Amrith, I really appreciate, uh, I, I think you hit on so many important, important points there. Michael, I would add to you to your issue of um, you know religion as essential uh, in in the pandemic. Um, also with um, racial and civil unrest, I think that it's really important. Those are places of dialogue. Religious houses of you know houses of worship, religious communities are places that foment dialogue. Um, and also from the partnership perspective, I will tell you that the immigrant community was the number one community that suffered because these are the places where they go to get information that they trust. And from some of the people that we represented, you know, at the Beckett Fund, we waited before we weighed in on, on the issue, on the legal issues associated with the lockdowns. And, um, and it did become untenable. It, and, it, and it was clear that these government officials were not having any kind of conversations with religious leaders who had partnered with them on a million other things. But on this, they just didn't want to talk because they didn't want what was perceived as a liability, I would assume. But I think there are a million other reasons why, mostly because they were thorn in their side and that's the wrong way to approach religion. Um, but because they didn't realize just how powerful religion can be as a solution. And the one anecdote that I thought was crazy is an archbishop saying that he wanted to be able to open the church so he could host not just um, a, uh, an, an Alcoholics Anonymous seminar so that he could stop domestic violence that he knew could happen, but also getting information to the community of um, undocumented immigrants that he had that couldn't, um, that didn't have access to this information because they didn't have TVs, they don't have radio, they don't have cars, they use the busing system. Like there is so much there and so many layers of our communities and people who are unnoticed and who go completely underneath the shadows that no one wants to recognize and the government can't reach. And they refuse to reach out to the religious partners who actually go out of their way to find those people and get them the information they need. So I, I agree with you that that is a, a hard point that I don't think any politician has really found a solution to or done well with. In the, in the time that I've been working on this issue, the lack of sensitivity uh, to what religion actually does um, is, is astounding. Well, on that note, I mean, we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience, and I want to turn to some of those. Um, there's a couple here that kind of, you know, so far this conversation, we've been talking about inclusion and like the diverse ideas of religion, but there's also ideas of spirituality. And so one person asks, um, can, can you all speak to people who are not religious? He or she writes, I'm deeply spiritual and grew up with atheist parents, and I've come to understand the value and separation of church or religion and government. I often feel religious folks hijack the entire conversation and it feels intimidating to those people who are very spiritual, but they're not include, they just feel like they're not included in the full discourse. And then relatedly, if I can throw in another somewhat um, 
connected, but also very distinct question that we're, we're at a time in the U.S. where we see a decrease in religious affiliation. Um, this person asked, can the decrease of religious identity among the population mean that the, our tribal affiliations have less to do or less to do with religion and more to do with nationalism? I'm happy to frame the beginning of an answer just because I don't actually represent a religious community. As much as I have personal religious beliefs, um, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty takes a position on religion generally as good for society, but not on any one religion or any culture war issue. Um, and, uh, and I think that's important. I do agree that the conversation has to include everyone. Um, most of the time when you're talking about issues of religious freedom, you are talking about a religious conversation. It's a conversation about something that someone believes. Um, but, but it is true that left out of that conversation are people who don't want to have to ascribe to a religion. And I think that's more on the international vein, something that's really important when the government has a point of view on religion or a an official religion. You see that around, around the globe. Here in the United States, we actually have the opposite problem where we're scared of the government saying anything about religion at all. Um, so it feels like a conversation that's overbearing on religious issues because we are having these tangles and also because that's what the media wants to show us. I think that less of these conversations happen, um, unfortunately. Uh, they're just shoved in our face in a different way. So I feel I feel with this person. I think that it's true that um, non-religious dialogue within the religious reality doesn't really happen and isn't respected, and there's not a lot of compassion for them. Um, at the same time, I do think that it's because we've lost again that religious literacy that allows us to have allows us to have a common language that helps us move from through these conflicts faster. Um, so we're kind of stuck, and it feels like the conversation is on a broken record because it is. Um, I can jump in here. So I sit in a really unique spot because I'm the legal director of a civil rights organization, but we focus on religious rights issues. So to this, uh, this individual who asked the question to your point, um, how do you navigate for people that um, are not affiliated with any religion and you know, how do you advocate for yourself? Um, it's a really interesting, on the legal front, it's a really interesting place because we have a system in place um, with the Civil Rights Act that essentially protects people on the basis of their religious beliefs and exercise and also on a number of other belief, uh, another protected uh, characteristics. And it also protects people who are non-religious believers, right? And I think that, um, the cases that we take on generally sort of sit in this space where at various times we have to make a determination and a decision on whether we are going to move in the direction of um, everything else, it doesn't matter, and we're completely focused on the religious rights issue, or, um, or we're going to sort of let some of our religious rights interests go in order to um, accept protections uh, in a different space for other protected classes. And I think that um, the issue that we as a society are, have always struggled with and will likely continue to struggle with is finding that balance and that sweet spot in um, protecting people and their religious rights, but also protecting people that are not necessarily religious or have rights that are protected based on other statuses and classes. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a full answer to you, to uh, your broader question, which is how do you advocate for yourself and make sure that you yourself are protected as um, you know someone who's not necessarily affiliated with any specific religion. I think that this is one of those never ending discussions and questions and um, aspects of courts and litigations that we're gonna kind of continue to see moving forward because striking that balance is uh, almost impossible um, the way we are currently fragmented. I'm hopeful that at some point we will get there. And um, to the other, to sort of the second question that you'd asked about, um, are we at a place where religion is in igniting and inflaming sort of this nationalistic approach? I actually, I think that the people that are doing that are just, I think they misunderstand what 
the true bases of uh, religious freedom really means. Because when you conflate religious freedom with ideologies of nationality that don't conform to our constitution and don't allow for freedoms and protections for all um, as our constitution does, what you're really, you're, you're not somebody who is acting in the name of religion. You're somebody who's acting in the name of something else that I do not believe should be attributed to any one religion, even if that's what you're calling out to. Um, I think there's a real distinction there. And I think that um, that's gotten really conflated over the last several years. And it's a place that um, as we sort of build these bridges, we are gonna really need to break those down. And we're really gonna need to get back to the basics and an understanding of how did all of our religions come about? What were the bases of these religions? I cannot think of a religion that didn't come about because somebody wasn't persecuted. I mean, that is the basis. And so we need to kind of get back to the place of understanding when we're thinking about religion in those terms and also understand that some of these movements that have come out, especially the nationalistic movements that have come out, um, just because somebody says that they're saying it, they're in, they're acting that way in the name of religion, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's accurate, you know, regardless of what this person might misunderstand about their motives. Um, the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs writes something, wrote something, a book, an entire book about religious violence and kind of co-opting religion in the name of violence and how dangerous that is. So I would just, not to harp on that, but I think Amrit, that's a fantastic point and a really important one, remembering the difference between co-opting religion for negative reasons, you know, very dangerous reasons, and then also understanding that religious freedom, you know, capital F on freedom, <laughs> and understanding that that's, that's, you know, it's your, it's your search, and it's very personal, and it's your relationship with God. So um, I'm with you there, and I think it's important to remember what other people have said about that. Yeah, just, well, I know Mike, we have to I get to, could, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to step in, just wanted to get a few yeah, more sure. questions, sure. and turn to you for, for some of the answers on that. So there's a bunch of questions here. You know, we've talked about civility, civic discourse, but people in the Q&A are really kind of grappling with the actual difficulty of, of what that looks like and to actually make it happen. And so, for example, one person is talking about Christians. You know, there's a lot of talk here about Christians versus minorities, but this person asks, well, what about the fact that many Christians themselves consider themselves persecuted minorities, right? And like that, how does that figure into it? And how do we distinguish that sense of being a minority versus being, for example, a numerical uh, minority. Um, another person, you know, is just saying that I'm a devout Christian and I don't even know where to begin in terms of kind of talking to my co-religionists. Can you give some guidance on, on what that conversation should look like um, to get just other people who are so closely tied, you know, connecting to another idea, this idea of this nation as a Christian nation? How do we even begin to sort of you know, kind of get through to those. I, I know that's a concern that many people are grappling with, but there is a deep held belief, and there's all these books that have been coming out in the past few years that I've seen that it's just all about, you know, debating this question about whether or not America is a Christian nation. And that ultimately then impacts the way people grapple with the question of minorities. And finally, there's a, a question we're going to, we'll start with Michael, but there is um, one question specifically um, for, for Monse asking, um, you know, most conversations about religious liberty that I've encountered as a religious conservative center on the perceived challenge from the LGBTQ movement and their view that certain positions held by religious conservatives are actually harmful. So how can both sides move forward in a way that goes beyond mere tolerance with it when there's such a deep disagreement about what it likes, what it looks like for people to flourish? So I'm going to let Michael start us off and then we'll get some thoughts from Monte. Yeah, so I'm going to need at least 90 seconds to unpack all that, but but no more than two minutes, and I think we'll have it all solved. Um, uh, th those are some really big questions. You know, a, a few a few comments, I think, hopefully spanning several of those those points. Um, it is important, as much as it is difficult, to try and um, uh, provide a bit of caution to just wait a little bit before jumping to a, a sense that people who disagree with you on issues that implicate religious freedom are motivated by antagonism. 
so many of our religious freedom disagreements are not fights between those who love religious freedom and those who hate religious freedom, but a conflict of, uh, of priorities, of perspectives. Um, and what that requires is, um, and this goes to the point about rising religious disaffiliation. It's important to note, there are these narratives and there's clear demographic trends uh, of religious disaffiliation. There are more religiously unaffiliated Americans now than ever before. Re uh, America is still a profoundly religious uh, country. And so what that means is that you have this, uh, this increasing section of religiously unaffiliated voters. In many cases, you know, we have the largest number of, uh, of Americans who did not grow up in religious homes and so may, may even lack a conception of what it means to be religious. And so what, what all that means is that so many of our religious freedom problems aren't ah, always intentional and antagonistic. Sometimes they go to a failure to conceive what it means to be religious. And in some, in some ways, the burden is on religious people to help their neighbors understand what it means to have a religious conscience, what it means to, uh, to, to uh, have religious exercise that is, uh, in many cases, uh, not just sort of tradition, or, but, but goes to the, to the very core of, of who you are. Um, th this is a time for um, uh, uh, sort of open-handed uh, education of one another, of, as we've talked about on this call before, uh, actually meeting one another and not having our guard up immediately. And so uh, that's just gonna be so important for, for some of the challenges that I think we all see coming down, uh, coming down um, the, the, the pike. Uh, I'll, I'll end my comments there because I know others wanna, wanna jump in. Asma, do you want me to jump in on that question about LGBTQ rights, et cetera? Um, yep. I think, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really hard question for many reasons. I think mostly because the political dialogue doesn't let people um, have real, um, real conversations around what these issues are and, and why they matter. And, and the hardest part is forcing people to choose between um, their, their religion and who they think they are and how they feel they are. Um, that's a really, really tough question. And people are being forced to choose between a way that they want to live their life and, and the, their religious affiliation. They're being told you're not actually religious if, you're, um, if you believe that you are this way or not this way, or you identify with certain communities. Like th that's making those decisions, decisions for people first and foremost is wrong. Um, and people have to have the freedom to you know, choose their lives and choose for themselves what they want their life to look like. So that's number one. And there are definitely places where religious groups overlap with, um, with adv advocates of um, gender identity issues on the discrimination side, housing, employment, et cetera. There is a lot there where more people come together than people think. And there's a lot of polling on that as well. The Religious Freedom Index that we have does a lot of polling on that to try to give people a place to start that dialogue of, hey, we all come together as human beings and believe that everyone has human dignity. And that means you have to have compassion for A, B, and C. That means that you have to also take into account that there are harms, there are realities um, where people are being discriminated against, kicked out of their homes, evicted, et cetera. Those are horrible realities that most people aren't having conversations about. So putting that aside, thinking about the religious freedom versus um, sexual orientation and gender identity issues, what people believe about marriage, about sexuality is something that is always going to be contentious. It's been contentious since the beginning of time. It's something that every government has struggled with. And anyone who thinks that this is a new issue isn't reading history. This is not a new issue. It's a new legal issue in the way that we deal with it in our country. But having different understandings of that um, and, and infighting in religious groups over that issue is not new. So we should always start there recognizing that these are really, really hard questions. The second piece is, are you really going to crush somebody because of what they believe? And that's a question that you have to ask both sides. Are you willing to crush someone because of what they believe and what and because you disagree with them? And is there a path forward that allows everyone to live according to their deeply held beliefs in a peaceful way? I believe that there is. 
I just think that um, people are trying to score political points on both sides. It's too attractive for fundraising or for career building to continue to have these issues be issues of contention. It makes for great letters that go out in the mail and, um, and raise a lot of dollars, but it's, it's ripping our country apart. And so I think on these issues, we have to find the middle ground where we can protect everyone because it is possible. And legally, it definitely is possible. And it doesn't mean it's, it's striking. It's, I don't wanna use the word compromise because it means someone loses something. I think there is a bigger picture solution here that allows everyone to live according to their conscience um, and doesn't force anyone to do one thing or another because our, our society is big enough for that. And it was built legally to be big enough for that. Thank you. So we just have, a uh, well, just one minute left. <laughs> Amrit, I wanted to give you the last word, um, especially on the question of, of civil dialogue across these very like difficult divides that, um, that I talked about that, and that we've talked about this, this whole hour. Um, and I also noticed that Amrit is typing a response to one of the questions in the Q&A. So if any of you want to do that, please feel free to. And Amrit, over to you. Uh, well, thank you again so much, Asma, for having me and Zenith and Abby and Allison. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, sort of just kind of trying to wrap up some of some of everything that we've discussed and and you know where this sort of takes us to the next level. Um, I think that there's been a lot of rhetoric um, about religion, about people who are non-religious, um, about where um, religion comes in conflict with culture and our policies and our society. Uh, I think we're sort of at a place where if there if there's going to be a future for religious freedom, um, we need to kind of get to a place of understanding of what that future might look like. Um, for example, you know, one of the things that I keep going back to um, as, as a legal director and dealing with this sort of, you know, in litigation terms is what does access look like? And if we as a society are going to continue on the path that we were built on and the foundation of a country that was built for, for people to, to be free, um, we need to get to a place where we understand that and balance what access is um, across all boundaries, whether it's access to education, whether it's access to um, state agencies and licensing exams, whether it's access to homes and real estate and job opportunities, um, government, social programming, social justice movements, you know, policies, whatever that looks like. We just kind of need to get to that point. Um, I think we also need to get to a point of understanding that um, if we don't frame religious freedom and the conflicts and the problems that we have in terms of, of wanting to get to a place of solution, if we only frame it in, in really adversarial terms, we are never ever gonna get to a place of understanding. Um, I don't expect that we as a society will ever, I mean, not in my lifetime, not if ever, get to a place where there's full understanding. But we need to get to a place where we are able to build a somewhat of a foundation that allows this level of freedom to move forward. Um, and we need a checks and balances system to allow that to happen, right? And I think that a big part of what our government needs to do now moving forward in functioning properly and representing the needs of the people is to figure out and collaborate what that foundational system looks like and how we can sort of uh, battle some of these challenges um, and and really what the challenges even are, because I don't know that there's a consensus there. Uh, I think what we're going to see in the next decade plus, um, no matter who's in office, is a real movement by um, millennials and the next generations. Um, you know, I've got kids 10 and 8, and I talk to them about this all the time and about how it's really going to be on them moving forward and their generations to kind of help us get to this place where we've, we've reached an understanding um, that access is important, understanding is important, tolerance is important, but um, beyond all of that, just having a dialogue is important because if we're not talking to each other, none of this is gonna come to fruition. Um, so I hope that we do eventually get to that place. And thank you again for having me on this panel. I'm grateful 
to be able to talk to people like Michael and Monsi and you, Asma, about these topics. Thank you, Amaris and, and Michael and Monse. Thank you first for really digging deep into the details and providing concrete solutions to a number of these thorny questions that we discussed today. Thank you also for emphasizing the importance of focusing on religion as religion for, you know, religion in terms of its substance, for the deep spirituality that, that, um, that is at the center of so many people's lives and not as a tool uh, for that is used and abused for political ends. As we discussed today, that is how religion is being used uh, on both the domestic and international fronts. And I think it's conversations like this, especially the way you all modeled uh, conversation across difference, that's hopefully going to help us get back to the substance and away from the abuse. Um, I now want to invite our panelists to turn off their videos and have Zena come back on screen for some reflections and next steps. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I always uh, think that at 90 minutes will be too long, and then the 90 minutes fly by, and I'm always surprised at um, how quickly they go. Um, Monse, you lamented in the beginning, um, or when we were talking about the insurrection on Capitol Hill last week, that what you were looking for was a moment of unified reflection. Um, I actually think each one of you today gave that to us, so thank you for your time and for your heart and your passion for this work, for giving us a moment of unified reflection around a topic that is, um, that is just very contested. Um, Michael, early in the conversation, um, said that religious freedom is crucial to figure out how we live together. Um, and I do think in essence, like that's my big takeaway from this, which is, you know, what I heard from all of you is that religious freedom is not a legal or political notion, um, but really a focus on the essential communitarian aspect of what it is, that we as individuals have a responsibility to expand our individual and institutional capacity to understand one another. Um, I really loved how much religious literacy was a part of this conversation um, and how I think each one of you conveyed the es essentialness of religious literacy for policymakers and public officials to have in order to level, have a level playing field where there isn't discrimination based on a lack of knowledge um, for, of people's faiths. So I hope to expand on this rich conversation in the days and weeks to come. And we certainly all um, look forward to the release of Asma's book um, in, uh, in March. We will upload a recording of this conversation on YouTube in the coming days, and we invite you to share it with your colleagues, your friends, and family. I hope to see all of you at future IAP programming, and I invite you to explore some of our resources. Um, one, that was, one that is very relevant is a report um, called The Politics of Vulnerability, led by um, Asma's work, which examines um, the fault lines polarizing about the polarizing fault lines between evangelical Christians and Muslims and asks if they can find common cause in religious freedom. We also have a report coming um, out in February, which will um, look at examining strengthening democracy through, through faith. Um, that's a case study led by Rabbi Michael Holzman on his work on the Rebuilding, Rebuilding Democracy Project. And finally, we post regular updates and frequently share resources on our Twitter account, which is at Aspen underscore IAP. And I hope you'll follow and engage with us there. Um, after leaving this webinar, you'll be directed to a very short and very anonymous survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how we did and how to improve on future conversations. Um, so thank you in advance for taking a few minutes to answer those conversations, uh, to respond to those questions. Um, and with that, I bid you adieu right on time. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to Asma. And um, we look forward to connecting with all of you soon.